Today's reading is from Judges 6, 11 to 24. The angel of the Lord came to Abizarite and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring, up, bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of, the God, of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abyssalite. This is the word of the Lord. We'll now have the children's ceremony. for you. You ready? Have you ever been asked to do something that you're worried you might not be very good at? You might not be the right person for the job. Do you get excited because it's something new? Or do you might feel nervous? Or maybe you want to ask questions about it? What do you think? Anything new? That one's not sure. I'm going to tell you guys a story about a guy named Gideon. You might feel sad. Maybe. You're right. There was a man named Gideon in the Bible, and he lived a long time ago in a place where the people of Israel had an enemy, right? They had come out of Egypt. They now had an enemy called the Midianites. They weren't very nice to the Israelites. They wanted to hurt them. And Gideon was just one person in a small family, and he was not a fighter. But one day when he was outside working, God came down as an angel and told Gideon, I want you to go and save Israel for us. I want you to tell the people, I am with you, and you are going to save everyone. Did Gideon say, yeah, that's me. I'm totally the right guy. Or do you think he had some questions? Hmm. Hmm. 
I would feel a little scared. I would feel like maybe that's not my job. Maybe I might not be right for that job. I might ask for some proof or ask questions. And that's what Gideon did too. He said, hey, can you please give me a sign that you're really with me, God, that this is really your plan, that this is really going to work? Because I'm not a fighter. I don't know if I can do this. And God said, yes, I'll wait. And Gideon went and got some food, and he put it on an altar, a big old rock. And God made the rock burn up the food. And Gideon knew God was there, and he could trust that this was God's plan. But the important thing about that story is not that Gideon had questions, not that he wasn't trusting God, but because God was patient with him, right? God said, I'll wait for you. God waited for Gideon to ask his questions. God waited for Gideon to ask for a sign. He knew the plan was going to work, but he was willing to wait because he is kind and he is patient. And that is so amazing because we know it's better to trust God's plan. We know he's going to take care of us. But he also knows that sometimes we need a little extra help right? This is such a good story because it shows that even if we aren't ready in our faith walk, God is there and he's going to wait for us. So even if we need a sign or if we need to ask questions or even if we feel maybe nervous or sad or scared, God is there waiting for us, right? Let's go ahead and do a little prayer. Close your hands. Dear God, Thank you for being so patient with us when we are afraid or unsure of your plans. Help us to learn to trust you more and more and remind us you are always with us even when we can't see it. Amen. My older kids, Miss Pam is going to be there. Gideon is such a fascinating character uh, found in the book of Judges. Good job, Susie Reed, and you did a great job with those difficult names. Um, but I want to tell you before we get too far into Gideon um, about my college house. All right, I'm a junior, or what am I, a junior or a senior? I'm probably a senior in college, and I go and rent a house with one of my buddies. And this house has hardwood floors with a giant hole in the middle of the dining room. Like a giant hole down to the crawl space that we decided, rent's pretty cheap here, let's just throw some plywood on top, and it's going to be okay. And it was. But in that house with the hole in it is where I sat down and wrote on a pad of paper what I was looking for in a seminary. I knew God had called me to go to seminary. It was this magical moment of like, Okay, I, God's called me to ministry. I'm supposed to go to seminary. I, I'd really like God for your guidance on where to go to seminary. There's only thousands of them in the United States. And so I get a, pad, a, yellow, a yellow pad of paper out, and I write down on this pad of paper four or five things that I'm looking for in a seminary. And I can't remember exactly what I wrote down, but you can see it. Line one, line two, line three, line four. And then I go search the denomination, the, the seminaries of the Disciples of Christ. And the first one didn't have anything that was on my paper. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to that one. The second one didn't have anything. The third one, though, was Christian Theological Seminary. And its mission statement was almost identical to what I had written down on my pad of paper. And I thought, okay, maybe the Lord's guiding me here. Well, let's see. What's it cost to go there? Oh, chance. By the way, you get to go there for free. Ooh, everybody went, ooh. 
Ooh, yeah, all right, I'm liking this. Lord, this is, this. okay, I'm feeling it. So Michaela and I pray about it, um, and we decide, you know what? We feel led here. And there was these moments where you just feel like God's right next to you, leading you, guiding you, like he gave you the magical glasses to see exactly what you're supposed to do. Have you guys ever had those kind of moments where it's just clear, there's perfect clarity, this is what God wants me to do, amen? Okay, you've had those. Then I got to seminary, and I'm this 22-year-old probably, and I'm eager and excited and ready to go. And I go into the room, and everybody in the room is over 40. And I was like, well, this is different than my undergraduate classes. Okay, maybe this will be great. And then I realized I'm a lot dumber than a 40-year-old. Okay, this isn't quite as exciting as I was hoping. Okay, this is going good, though, and it, it's going okay. But the fire I had about seminary starts to fade away. All right, it's fading away. I'm not that excited to go to class anymore. My wife is like, well, what are you going to do? You, you just got there. What's going on? The, the, but the fire is fading. I'm not excited about it anymore. So much so that after my first year, I go to my first class, and I'm sitting in class, and I'm thinking, you know what? If something drastic doesn't happen, I think I'm done. I think I'm done with seminary. And you know what that means? I'm probably done being a minister. God must have messed up. He must have like told me wrong. I must have misheard. There's just something that ain't clicking here. And as I'm literally sitting in my chair for my first class of my second year of school, the prototypical black preacher, big, sweaty, like yelling, just, oh, just perfect. It just feels like he kicks the door in and he walks into class and he goes to the front of the room and he points at Chance and goes, you're a preacher. I just gave myself goosebumps with that. I'm not, there's not a part of that that's exaggerated, not a part of that that I'm lying about. It was like, I'm sitting in my seat wrestling with, I must not need to be a preacher. It ain't working. The fire's gone, it's faded. And in comes a guy who looks like T.D. Jakes and says, you're a preacher. Okay, God is right. I think it was a different word than that. Oh, crap is what came out. <laughs> there was confirmation. There was clarity in that moment. After that moment, I haven't doubted that I meant to be a preacher. Not a moment since then. But before that, the fire was fading. And we're at a moment here in Gideon's story. Okay? Go with me to Gideon's story. His people are ruled by people called the Midianites. Can you say Midianite? Midianite. Good. They're ruling over them. So much so that they've gone and they're hiding in caves to get away from them. And so what he is doing, Gideon, is he's going to a wine press and he's hiding in there Grounding wheat to make bread to eat. Okay, he's hiding from people. And the angel of the Lord shows up and says, Hey there, mighty warrior. Do you feel like a mighty warrior when you're hiding? No. Okay, the mighty... <laughs> it's almost comical. I want... You to go rescue your people, the angel says to him. Go and save your people. You're going to do it. I'm calling you, aren't I? And I don't know about you, but when an angel shows up and tells you what to do, what do you normally say? Yes, sir. I'm going. Gideon's an interesting character because I think he's more like us than we realize. He says, Did I hear you right? Are you sure? You know what I need? I need a sign. Give me an amen if you've ever asked God for a sign. Amen. If you've seen Bruce Almighty, it's one of, the best, one of the best examples. He's driving in his car going, I need a sign. And a truck pulls in front of him and only has like 84 stop signs in it. And he goes, how come God won't give me a sign? 
We ask and we ask and we ask. We need a sign. And so Gideon tells this angel, he says, okay, don't go anywhere. I need to go make an offering. Please don't leave. And the angel says, okay, I will wait. And so he goes and he prepares a meal. Okay, bread, kind of like a pot roast, I guess. Bread, meat, and broth. And he brings it back. And the angel says, okay, pour it on this, I liked how she said it, the altar or a rock. He pours it out, and what's the angel do? Anybody remember? Yes, touched it with his staff, and it lit on fire. And then the angel disappears. After it lights on fire, the angel disappears. This is where I think a lot of us land sometimes. We hear God guiding us. We have the clarity. But the fire starts to fade. And the angel disappears. And we find ourselves going, whoa, hold on a second. I might be in the wrong place. Whoa, hold on a second. God, where would you go? Is God gone? If you remember, Gideon answered the angel the first time with that. Where has God been? What about us? What is happening to us? Like, God's gone. I think a lot of us can feel that way sometimes. We've heard the Lord speak. We've felt him guide us. But right now, there's just a moment in our life where we're like, what? Where is he? I need a sign. I need something. The fire has faded. The angel has disappeared. It feels like God's gone. And when God is gone... We get all nervous. When we don't feel like we're in unison with God, we tend to get nervous and bent out of shape. We almost quit seminary. We quit going to church. We quit praying. We quit reading. We stop because the fire has gone out. The angel has disappeared. The angel has disappeared. There's something interesting in this text, though. I think it's on the next screen, verse 23. The angel has dis- disappeared. And you guys remember what he said? Yeah, right there. That's perfect. Do you remember what Gideon said after the angel disappeared? Oh, no. I have seen the Lord face to face. There's no more fire. There's no more angel. What's this say on the screen? It's the very next verse. Don't read that one. The next screen. No, back. You're on the right one. Verse 23 is what it says at the top. But the Lord said to him. Everybody say that out loud, will you? But the Lord said to him. There's no angel. The fire has faded. But the Lord said to him. The fire fades, the angel disappears, but the Lord remains. When your fire is fading, when it feels like God is gone, when it feels like I haven't heard the Lord speak, Pastor, in so long I can't even relate to what you're talking about, when it feels like you are distant, you have to remember these words. Now you can go to the two slides forward, Chuck. Remember these words. In Judges 6, 1, Judges 6, 16, he says it to Gideon, I will be with you. And guess who says those words thousands of years, thousands of years later? Jesus, as he's leaving. And surely I am with you always. Translated another way, I will be with you. And that should bring us hope. And when our fire is fading, that when the angel disappears, when it feels like we're distant, that God is still there. For what we do is not by our power, but by God's presence. What we do is not by our power, but by God's presence. Okay, when God is leading you to go to seminary, when God is leading you to go do something, 
There's a million things that will disqualify you. You heard Gideon say it, right? You heard Gideon say, hold on a second. I'm the youngest in my family, and I'm a part of the weakest part of this nation we have. I'm the weakest of the weak. You want me to lead an army? No way. And what does God say? I will be with you. It is not our power, but God's presence. So when you hear God leading you to something and you say, I am too young, God will say, I am with you. When God leads you to something and you say, I'm too old, God will say, I am with you. You aren't smart enough. I am with you. You have messed up too much. I am with you. Do you get it? It is not our power, but God's presence. And it isn't until we realize this, that it's not about us, but about God. It isn't what we do, but how much of God's presence we're willing to allow to take us over. It isn't until we realize it's not through our power, but through his presence, that we can say what Gideon said, the Lord is peace. You will not have peace. Until you realize that. It's not by my power, but by God's presence. You can try and manufacture it all you want. Trust me, I just tried. I went on two vacations in four weeks. And guess what? I was more tired when I got back than when I went. You can try all the self-care you want. The people I know who do the most self-care are the ones the most or the least peaceful people I know. You can try meditation. You can try alcohol. You can try drugs. You can try whatever you want to try to gain yourself some peace. But I can promise you from the Word of God, you cannot have peace until you realize that it's not your power but God's presence. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so for those of you seeking clarity, for those of you wondering where's my peace, for those of you waiting for God's guidance, for those of you who are looking for anything to do with God, what you're typically looking for is a sign. Right? Typically you're like, show me something. Make some things line up. Make them repeat themselves. Make it just to where I can have no doubt. I just prayed that prayer this week. Let me tell you, you're not alone. Gideon got his own couple chapters in the Bible. And this is what he did. You heard about the food. Here's one sign I need. A little bit later, he's getting ready to take these people to defeat the Midianites. And you know what Gideon does? He goes, God, I just want to make sure I didn't hear you wrong. I need a sign. And so he takes a fleece and he lays it out. And he says, okay, God, if you'll make this fleece sopping wet when I wake up, but all the ground around it dry, I believe you want me to go to war. So he goes to sleep and he wakes up. And what happened? The ground is dry and the fleece is sopping wet. And what's Gideon say? Oh, hold on, hold on a second. You know what? That could have been a coincidence. Um, I need you to do the complete opposite tonight. Tonight, I need the ground to be sopping wet and the fleece to be completely dry. So he goes to sleep and he wakes up the next day and guess what? It's exactly like he said. He's asking for signs and God has given them to him. Did God get mad that he asked for a sign? No. Let me ask that again. Did God get mad that he asked for a sign? No. Does God get mad at you because you want clarity? No. That should be a big deal. A lot of us carry this guilt around of not knowing, of of asking for a sign. We're like, "Eh, it, it it shows that I lack. It shows that I lack faith. It shows that I don't know. It shows, and and why would you know? Why would you know? Why would I know? Why would any of us know exactly what God wants from us all the time? 
Oh yeah, because there was this guy. His name was Jesus Christ. And he laid it out pretty easy. He laid it out. It wasn't complicated. It was demanding, but it wasn't complicated. Do you remember what you're supposed to do? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But is it a bad thing, Pastor? Let's go to the next slide. This is getting it from our text today. If now I have found favor in your eyes, Gideon says to the angel, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Next. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And what does the angel of the Lord say? Not the angel of the Lord. What does the Lord say? I will wait until you return. He doesn't say ye of little faith. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to go on to the next guy. So church, ask for your signs. Bring the food and lay it on the rock. Lay the fleece out. And know that the fire 